Hey, friends and listeners of the Switch for Good podcast. Yep, that's you. I have some really exciting news. Dotsy and I have started a Switch for Good podcast Facebook group. We created it so we can build a community of fans that will help us improve the show and deliver on the topics that you want to learn more about. So we want to hear what your favorite content is, what you want more of, and what you want less of. And if you like the length of the show, Dotsie and I are always talking about the length of the show, right, Dotsie? Yes. We want to tailor our show around the needs and desires of our incredible listeners, almost half a million of you. And it's really simple to join. Just go to our Switch for Good Facebook page. That's Switch, the number four, and then Good. And then click on Groups. And there we are, the Switch for Good podcast chat. You can post directly in the group, share ideas, talk to other listeners, and connect with like-minded folks. So go, run, join our Facebook group, and tell us what you want. Good morning and good afternoon, good evening to all of you out there. We're so happy to welcome you to the Switch for Good podcast. I'm Dotsie Bausch, and I'm here with Alexandra, still remote, but it's lovely to see your face. Great to see you, Dotsie. <laughs> well, you know I'm, I've been really excited about this episode. We are uh, covering the topic of leadership and all that it entails today with uh, our acclaimed guest, who we're going to introduce in, in a moment. Uh, so this is going to take, this takes a little bit of a, of a, of a hard left turn, right, from uh, a lot of the topics that we normally traverse. But we, we have been getting feedback uh, from our folks in our Facebook group that they're excited for us to traverse into uh, some new directions. So this is going to be uh, a little bit specific because I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I'm greedy uh, to my leadership of Switch for Good. So that's how it's going to come back to the movement that we're both in. Uh, Alexandra has, has been lovely in, in allowing me and saying that I could um, kind of uh, take over a little bit <laughs> because I've had so many challenges in leadership. And I, I have to be uh, vulnerable and open uh, that it's, it's, been, it's been the hardest thing I've ever done in my whole life. And I have walked into many a podcast uh, to uh, think that I am, I am handling it and I'm being strong and everything's working only to see Alexandra's loving and uh, faithful face and burst into tears because I'm, I'm scared and because I feel like I'm not doing the job that the organization deserves and I feel um, not, uh, not capable and, and, and very, very far from the rock star that I want to feel like to be able to effectively run this organization and uh, take us uh, to new levels and new heights to save lives. So Alexandra has been an incredible mentor and love and support uh, through my leadership challenges. So we're going to dive in. I, I will start out with saying that uh, I have always felt before uh, leading this organization that that leadership seems you know to me before just somewhat kind of benign in nature like oh, okay leadership the word right to most it means kind of you know collectively bringing people together um, inspiring them to do good work uh, showing them the way forward uh, and in our case you know challenging old world beliefs uh, and getting people to trust you, right? And your direction for those, um, you know, challenges of the beliefs and, and for the company. But what I found as I've traversed down this leadership road is that there's so many nuances to what it takes to be a good leader. And it, it quite honestly starts with the fiber of that person leading and their, their personality, right? Their hard wiring and their soft wiring. And I've learned because I have a mentor, I have a career coach, I have a therapist, because all of these things are now needed in my life since running this organization to try to be the best version of a leader that, that I can be. I've learned that hardwiring um, is are things that are, are literally built into us, built into our personality, right? They're, they're what we're born with. Um, 
uh, basically you're, you're hardwired into your system that, that really can't be changed or rebooted. So think of your hardwiring on your computer versus your soft wiring or your software. Soft wiring is the part of your personality that was learned, right? And can over time with new experiences and, and learning morph or, or change somewhat, I should say. So what I have found according to my hardwiring after working with the leadership coach and, and, and taking multiple tests like predictive index and others, I've learned that I have a fairly difficult hardwiring <laughs> to be leading an organization. Wasn't that shocking to find that out? I thought I, I knew something felt, you know, like I was just in a headwind almost, you know, 24 seven. But I can do it, I, I, I can do it, but it's gonna take much more effort uh, than someone with, with maybe opposite personality traits. The two traits that, that kind of rise to the top for me that um, I have a, a very extreme tendency towards um, are one, I have uh, an immense need to be independent. So I have an extreme tendency towards total independence. And the opposite of independence is collaboration. <laughs> Right. So, yeah, it turns out you need to be a collaborator to create a well integrated team. And that isn't something that runs in the fiber of, of who I am. I'm, I'm much, much more independence, independent. I am also an extreme introvert. And that does not mean I'm shy. Right. People always say, oh, you're not an introvert. There's no way. You know, and, and a lot of people think that that word means shy, but it actually um, means that I. Uh, um, one of the things it means is that I'm, I'm highly uncomfortable and get easily drained energetically by small group situations. So you, introverts are usually either comfortable in, you know, very personal, intimate one-on-one -on -one situations like deep, meaningful friendships and, 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 and even work friendships or in front of like a huge crowd, like in, in front of 5,000 people. But those 10 person small group huddles are kind of an introvert's uh, nightmare to say. And given that I'm leading a, uh, you know, a, a small team, we are a startup and there's only about, you know, 10 or 15 of us, uh, give or take from, that we have some consultants too, uh, that, that, is, that is what I'm faced with. So the question is, uh, among many others that we have today, is how do you lead effectively when your hard wiring is not necessarily set up for easy leading, right? It just kind of, it, it, it doesn't run natural in you. Uh, and you, you know, I found that you, you have to work on it. You have to work hard at it. And, and that's certainly something I'm, I'm trying to do consistently uh, every single day. So I'm excited to have our guest today because he has some of the keys to what unlocks a great leader. While some may believe a leader in any professional setting should be stoic, you know, I may have even had that belief before, our guest today has found that actually the opposite is true. Tom Gartland is the author of Lead With Heart. And for those of you looking on YouTube, here is the book that I treasure. It's a new book that redefines the role of leadership. Through his own experience as a former president of the Avis, Avis Budget Group's North American chapter, he found that being personal was the best way to inspire others and create not only a safe workplace, but a workplace that got results. Now, in this book, Tom has provided the tools uh, managers and leaders need to create a workplace community and also to drive sales. And, and, and so many of those tools are what we're going to dive into in Traverse. I was absolutely hooked on his every word. I've read the book twice and I am so thrilled as it's Alexander to have him on the podcast today. So welcome, welcome, Tom. Hello. Good morning. Good afternoon. Glad to be here. Thank you. That was, uh, that was quite an introduction. And well, um, yeah, we, we may be here for three hours, so we'll just have, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's been a, it's been a, it's been a bitch, I tell you. I mean, just putting it really frankly, it's, and I, I, you know, it, it really wasn't anything that I expected it to be, but, uh, and, and so many wonderful things too, I'm, I might add. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm just, we're obviously 
hyper focused in on this leadership conversation, but um, there, there, there's so many wonderful aspects to, to the organization in general that um, I, I have enjoyed. But I would love to start out with you, uh, if we could, on leadership as it relates to how personal one should get. So your philosophy in the book is, is transforming your business and how to do that through more personal connections. And in my own experience, I think that because I'm an introvert and because I connect deeply one-on-one -on -one and not necessarily in small groups, but I really like deep, meaningful relationships one-on-one, -on -one, that's how I gain my energy and, and not lose my energy. I believe I've allowed too personal of a relationships to unfold sometimes. And being a small spark startup, you know, I work closely and have developed deep personal relationships with some of my staff. You know, it, it, you're in the trenches together, your personal lives collide, you support each other. And I thought that that was kind of what's needed, right? To, to, to you know, to, to really be fully uh, a 360 degrees dis, dis, um, supportive of someone. It's not just their work life, it's, it's their life. Um, that's unfortunately turned out to, to burn me. And I've had some uh, staff turn on me and even try, uh, and I'm just gonna be really frank here, it, it even extort money, um, kind of uh, coming back with, with lying about statements that I made or, you know, and, and it, that was built over the closeness of um, our relationship. And as I've traversed that, I believe that's why so many leaders over time create these really thick shields for protection, which is kind of the opposite of what you teach people to do in your book. Um, I've consulted in my previous life for some CEOs of, of really prominent public companies, so huge organization, and their shells are as thick as you know, bomb shelter walls. And, and now running my own organization and what I've been through, I can see why. I can see why they built these walls. So my first question is, how on earth do you navigate effectively how close is too close how personal is too personal and 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 where do you draw the lines well that's a that's a big question um i, I guess i would start with um having a personal relationship within the within your company or within your workspace starts it's got to be based on trust and it has to be a two-way street it has to be uh, the people you are working with want you, want you to share your life with them, and you want them to share their life with you. Um, and quite frankly, we spend way more time at work than we spend in any other aspect of our life. So the people we work with are very, very important to us. And I think it's, it's important to get to know them as a human being first. And then as an employee or whatever their role or function is in the organization. And I think never uh, has this been more necessary than in the last year. We're in people's homes now. You're, you're in my home as we're doing this podcast. I'm in your home. It's, it's very personal. And a lot of people have struggled uh, working remotely and so on. And I think the leaders that have a personal relationship um, will have a leg up and, and have had a leg up during this whole uh, pandemic for the last year. But not everyone is going to be wonderful. And some people will burn you. And, and when that happens, then the best thing you can do is, is have them exit the organization as quickly as possible. Um, but, you know, just in your introduction, you, you, demo, you understand what I call natural tendencies. You call it hardwiring. <clears throat> you understand what your natural tendencies are. You've obviously shared them with your team because you're sharing them with me today on this podcast. So they understand who you are. And, and what um, you're trying to do by being vulnerable, by being that vulnerable, saying, look, this is who I am. I want to be an effective leader. This is who I am. And by the way, I haven't done I, that. I mean, I just don't want to okay. shake my head. Like I, I, I haven't. And that's what I'm learning because I'm just learning this. So thank you for that yeah. because you're, you're definitely suggesting that that would be step one. Absolutely. Um, you know, you, your first uh, trait you mentioned was independent versus collaboration. 
for me, and I talk a little bit about it in the book, I moved too fast. And once I had something in my, in my mind and, and I, I felt it was the right thing to do and pull the trigger and execute for the company, I would move. And what I realized is that I had 13 people that worked directly with me every day. And if I didn't bring them along the journey with me, then it was just my idea. And, or it was, it was something I came up with and executed. But if we all kind of work together and I, and I took the time to work with them and bring them with me, instead of being so quick or so independent, maybe, um, we were much more effective. Now, there are times when I had to make decisions and move quickly and, and I couldn't wait. But because I knew that was a natural tendency for me and because I shared it with the team and the team shared back with me how it made them feel when I did that in, in kind of our own personal 360, uh, I was able to minimize the effect of that hardwiring or natural tendency. Um, so that was helpful. You know, the introvert piece that you mentioned um, and you have a team of 10 or 15 people you're working with, again, being totally vulnerable and say, this is what it's difficult for me. It's, it's easier for me to work maybe one-on-one -on -one or two to, two to one than it is in a, in a meeting setting with 10 or 15 people. And um, people will accommodate that and will try and, you know, especially if you have a personal relationship with them or a trusting relationship with them, they'll try and accommodate that. Equally as important is that you understand their their hardwiring or what their issues are. So we used a um, we used a, a natural tendency uh, test called the Caliper. It was invented by a guy named Herb Greenberg, who's passed away now. Uh, companies out in Princeton, New Jersey, still use it today. Probably looked at ten thousand calipers in my life. Um, but it, it looks at the natural tendencies of leaders and in, in who they are and things you can't change. But, it, but if you know yours and you know the team, so if the team is done, you've all taken this same uh, test, you can help each other uh, be better. So we, we had a person on our team, for example, um, whose ego strength was five. Now, ego strength is how, how confident you are with, about yourself as a leader and, and, a, and a person. And her particular ego strength was five. Now, is she that was five a five out of five? Five out of a hundred. Oh, oh. Five out of a hundred. Okay. Right? So uh, where most leaders are, you know, 80 to 90% in range in the ego strength. She was in the 5% range. Very skilled intellectual, tremendous in her role, but when she was in a room with people and if someone said something harshly or, or strongly to her, she shut down, yeah. completely shut down. So by sharing her caliper, we all sat in the room together and went through it with a, with a psychologist from the caliper company and shared each other's calipers. We knew how to, we, we got better at working with people with within their strengths and their weaknesses and in this particular case we knew that if somebody if she had an idea and if you said that's really not a great idea she would just shut down so we had a and then we got her a coach which mm -hmm. you talked about in your opening having you know athletes have coaches in every aspect of what they're what they're training in so should executives yeah. I'd love to go back to that hardwiring example that you gave that goes against your hardwiring, your, um, uh, your, your, you know, personality, uh, your genuineness, as far as speed goes, and you pressed, you, you really pressed the speed. I definitely have that problem. Somebody will say, Oh, yeah, let me let me get that to you in 30 days. And I'm like, 30 days? How about three? I mean, I could, you know, and you, I could do that in years. Like, okay, don't say that out loud. Don't say I could, you know, like, uh, and so I, I struggle with that. I would love an example of how you internally, I know that you said, you know, you, you had to work with the team collaboratively then to, you know, come together to figure out like a time frame. but you internally, how you would work through that. Cause I still have in the back of my head, um, 
you know, constantly. And Alexandra knows this just by the very nature of what we do and the movement that we're in. We're saving lives, we're saving lives, we're saving lives. So, you know, everybody has to work at warp speed. And I know that that's not true and that's not really the best way forward either for everyone to do their best work. So what, what's a personal example of how you kind of moved through that deep need for things to, to move at, at, at a way faster pace than they probably needed to? Yeah, I, I'll, let me think a little bit, but um, what you're really talking about is urgency. And, and uh, my sense of urgency is, again, using the caliper is probably uh, 99%. So I'm an aggressive, assertive person with a high sense of urgency. And, you know, it was just the expectation and sharing the expectation of the purpose and what we'd want to accomplish in what time frame. And then people, uh, you know, they got to carry their water. They, they have to carry their own weight and get it done. And I think there's nothing wrong with expressing your sense of urgency <clears throat> and that you know your expectation as a leader of the of, of your business your expectation is that we'll have this behind us in 3 days 5 days 6 days wh whatever the time frame is um and and then you push the team to get there and that's okay as long as you're pushing yourself and demonstrating that you're willing to work shoulder to shoulder with anybody to achieve the result that you're trying to achieve People see that, they respect it. Not all people can run at that pace mm -hmm. and that's okay. Then they may self-select out or, or you'll select them out. But if you have a business that runs at it with a high sense of urgency or, you know, go, let's go back to a year ago, March, at the height of the pandemic. And I advise several companies now in my retirement. Mm -hmm. The very first thing that everyone needed to focus on was cash. And what's your 13 week cash plan in order to survive? Mm -hmm. There are companies that, that I'm advising that completely shut down, shut down, no revenue coming in. So how are you going to survive? And what is your cash plan? And, and the sense of urgency was not next week. It's tomorrow where we're going to review this again. These were 14 hour days some days, six, seven days a week during the height of, you know, the first, I would say, mid-March to mid-April. And quite honestly, some people didn't make it. And that's okay. And, and quite frankly, when I, I think this, the uh, crisis and the pandemic allowed many companies to have people, the cream rise to the top, and allow uh, other people to say, you know what, I'm not made for this game. This, this is just too much, too fast, and, and it doesn't work. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. And as a leader, there's nothing wrong with expressing what, your, what, what the purpose is, what the strategy is, what the KPIs are, and when we're going to achieve them. So, um, Dotsie, thank you for sharing your vulnerabilities with us. And now it sounds like you're going to also share it with your team after Tom's advice. Um, Tom, I'd like to, can we go specifically to your book, which I found also sure. so interesting with so many different stories. Uh, so for folks listening today, this isn't just about being a leader in a business. It's about being a leader in your own life and how to communicate and connect with people. I was reading it since I know very well that I don't like to be a leader. I'm a really good right-hand person because I I'm, do what I'm told and pretty much am very reliable, but I do not like leading because I um, do not like conflict. And um, so I, can't ma I don't manage people because I want everyone to yeah. like me. Um, but Tom, tell us a little bit about you before you began to lead with the philosophy that you now call leading with heart. And what was the catalyst that got you there? It was, <clears throat> that's a great question. Um, it was a reinvention when I shifted careers. I, I spent 28 years in the institutional cleaning chemical business 
the last 14 with um, a business in Wisconsin owned by the Johnson family, SC Johnson family. And, um, and I was hired to go to Avis and Budget in New Jersey. And so I was really leaving the Midwest for the first time. Uh, I grew up in Minnesota and friends and family and kids and, you know, lot, lots of folks between Minnesota and Wisconsin, very close. And my kids had really grown up. My youngest was now in college and we were uh, accepting a job and going to the East Coast and going to New Jersey. And we got there and we didn't know a soul. And, and remember when I said, when, we, when you go to work, you spend 12 hours a day at work, you spend more time at work than you do at home. And so when I had business dinners at night, I, I brought my wife, which was a no-no in the first 28 years of my career. But now I was leading the business. I said, the heck with it. My wife's out here. We're strangers. We don't know a soul. And we have a business dinner. I'm going to bring my wife to dinner. And uh, the people I worked with actually enjoyed her more than they enjoyed me. And, and then I invited their wives when we had a business dinner because they, they, they were in the same circumstance. Their, you know, their spouse was gone for 10 or 12 hours that day while, while they were working. They wanted to see him, but unfortunately had to go to a dinner. So, so if your spouse is available, your partner or whatever, bring them. And that really led to the beginning of the personal connections with the folks that I was working with. And then we hosted a holiday party uh, with Santa Claus. Um, I, I dressed up as Santa Claus and it, we, it was really a tremendous experience because we had 800 people in the office and the office like the week before was clean. Everybody cleaned all their spaces in the office and then they put new pictures up of their children because their families were coming to their workplace. And so we, we met a lot of the families and then the children. And that whole, you know, family culture really began to take, take shape. And, and I think people genuinely knew that we cared about them as human beings first. But it really happened through, a, through, for me, through this reinvention of leaving one industry, the institutional cleaning chemical industry for 28 years to go to car rental, to go to the East Coast where we didn't know anyone and really start with the folks I worked with every day being part of my family. And, and I've always been in the revenue side of business. I, I started out as an entry level salesperson. And what I realized early on in my, in my career was that when you met good people, bring them in and make them part of your family. So, you know, I, there's, uh, in the book, I talk about Dave Ridley, for example, the chief marketing officer of Southwest Airlines. Um, he's since retired now, but I met Dave. There's a story in the book on how we connected as human beings. I won't, I won't bore you with that. But he's a great human being, just a terrific man. And, and then along the way, I met his wife, Flo Flo, Mary Flo. She's a wonderful woman. She knew my wife. I mean, the four of us got along. Great values, human, great values, characteristic, great people. Well, uh, eight months after I retired, my daughter at 26 weeks delivered uh, one of our grandchildren who was in intensive care at Children's Hospital in in Dallas, Texas for six months. And thank goodness we were, we were retired because we could go back and forth and spend plenty of time in Dallas. But at Thanksgiving that year, my, my grandson is um, still in the hospital. My daughter spends, you know, 18 hours a day in the hospital with him. And our whole family, we wanted to be together. And Dave said, you know what? They were going to the Carolinas for Thanksgiving. Here's enjoy our house for the week. Now, this was, this was a business partner who then became a personal friend who then gave us their home in one of the you know, very difficult times for our entire family. So it wasn't just my wife and I, but it was extended other children and, and spouses, and they gave us their house in Dallas. That's the most rewarding thing of all, when you meet those kind of folks and you make them part of your family or part of your life. 
And, and that's what we were able to do at Avis. Um, and it was really a rewarding experience. Yeah, there's a case to be made for vulnerability again there, right? Being, um, because of, I mean, it, what a vulnerable position to be in with what you were going through. Um, one story that you shared with people you work with was also the very personal challenge of, of your son's drug addiction. And you didn't just share the fact that he was addicted and kind of leave it at that, but you're also your failure to parent properly. That, that's to me, that came across to me as, as um, it's just intense, uh, obviously, but to share that with your kind of work people, your work family, what, what was yielded from that level of vulnerability that a you great, portrayed? That is a great question. Um, well, let me, let me just share a little bit about that story. So yeah. um, we were we were in our board. It was the end of the quarter, and we had a board meeting. And the board meeting lasts about two days with our outside directors, and very intense time. <clears throat> and our granddaughter, who was I don't know seven at the time, I guess, called uh, my wife and said, "Grammy, you know, can you help me? My dad smokes pot every day." Mm. And so. Uh, and that happened like on a Thursday and, and my wife didn't tell me because I was in the middle of the board thing. So Friday I got home from work and we sat down and she told me the story and then we called our other kids and, and they confirmed, they knew we had a drug issue and, you know, we, we were out to lunch. We enabled him. We, we were enablers for, for certain now that we've looked back on all this. And, um, and anyway, that was Friday, and by Sunday, we had a family intervention in Minneapolis, and he was in Hazleton um, Betty Ford Clinic, uh, and that was 10 years ago, February. And, um, and I came back to work then on Monday, back to New Jersey, and we were in our team meeting, staff meeting, and I shared it with our team. And I can tell you that every person in that room either as a parent, a brother or sister, a child who's been, who's had an addiction problem of one kind or another, whether it's drugs, alcohol, food, something, an, an addiction problem. And when you, when I shared that, I didn't share it for sympathy, but what I found out was that others then said, you know, I had this happen, or this is my brother went through this, or my dad, my parents, or whatever. And you realize this touches everybody. And quite frankly, I, you know, it was wonderful having the support of the people that I worked with that I wasn't alone. My wife and I weren't alone in dealing with addiction. And then uh, we went back three weeks later, we went to what they call the family program. And um, which was an awesome program where we learned about what we were doing wrong as enablers, as parents. And it was a four day program. We brought uh, everybody through it, all of our other kids too. So we could deal with this, with this child who was, a, who was an addict. Um, anyway, long story short, he's uh, celebrated his 10th year of sobriety in February, um, which is really quite a, a tremendous achievement. So we're very, very proud of him. But everybody's had something. Yeah. And so, and then when, when you open up about those things, people will open up back to you. And this is where to be an effective leader or lead with heart takes a lot of energy because you always have to be there. When they need you, you have to be there. Yeah, I, what I thought was so especially powerful was that you didn't just say, oh, my son has a problem. You said, I have a problem and I'm learning and my wife and I are working on it. And I think that that yeah. extra step was very special because you talked, you were basically admitting to your own weaknesses, which leaders don't often do as Dotsie mentioned. Let me ask you, cause you're a white male. Dotsie being a woman, um, when she is, you are emotional, not only are you able to 
express your thoughts and your vulnerabilities, but you also show them by some, sometimes you cry when you're either talking about yourself or hearing other people's stories. You said that you're, you, you were emotional during your time at Avis and open that way with your employees. When a woman does that, um, they are considered, you know, too soft, not professional. Um, when a person of color does that, it somehow also comes off as not professional. As a white male, it actually will add to your persona because you're already endowed with a perception of being strong because you, you're the head of a huge company that has 22,000 employees. Can you talk a little to that? Yeah, it's, um, it's a stereotype, right? We deal with stereotypes in, in every aspect of our lives, unfortunately. Um, and it's a difficult, it's very difficult. Um, but I think, you know, when Dotsie started out, her, this, the introduction, she, she was very vulnerable about what her hardwiring issues were, what I call natural tendencies are. And she wasn't afraid to say it. She wasn't afraid to be vulnerable to say it. And she's not afraid to say, I'm independent, I'm aggressive, uh, my words, uh, aggressive. I, I'm, I have a sense of urgency. And I need to be surrounded by people like that. And I want to have that personal relationship with them. But if they burn me, I, you know, I have to fix it. And uh, so I think she demonstrated all of those things just in the opening. But it is, it is, uh, and I talk about this in the book a little bit. Um, and um, I'm counseling right now, I'm advising, not counseling, advising a uh, woman who's the CEO of a business out in, uh, out in New York, New Jersey. And, and she's oftentimes will say, I'm the only woman on the phone. I can't talk that way. Mm -hmm. And it's unfortunate because um, that's not really true, but she's not ready to take the reins yet and, and have that, you know, that I can be vulnerable, but yet a leader, you know, and the confidence really, it's a, it's a confidence based on um, success over time. Um, but Alexandra, that's a stereotype we deal with and women especially, and it's not fair. It's not fair. So um, some women may go the other way where they put up those shields, like you were saying, and you know, keep work at work and my personal life and my personal life. It's been a journey for me for sure to even reach a, like a vulnerable, um, way of, of leading. You know, I, I think there was a very tough exterior that I didn't even realize I was putting out there to the team in the beginning. Cause I mean, inside of it all, I'm a big softy. A lot of us are. Uh, <laughs> and I had someone say once, you know, you're, you know, you, you're something, something, you're tough exterior. And I'm like, what? I'm so not a tough, you know? And I thought, Oh, wow. You know, I, I was just projecting that not even knowing it. Uh, for for fear, I think of what Alexandra's talking about, right? Like I, I became yeah. this leader, and it was like, okay, these are all the things I have to act like I am. Right. Yeah. Right. And just take a you long you time. you want to act the way you think you should, right? Versus yep. just be natural and be who you are, um, mm -hmm. and allow that vulnerability to to seep in. And um, but I think it's important that you, you know, you say you're a softy. Um, I'm a, I'm like a big teddy bear. I, you know, I'm, I, I can get emotional. I can cry over certain things and tear up, but I don't think anybody ever, ever, ever misunderstood what the overarching, uh, you know, expectations for the company were and, and the results that we were trying to seek and what their accountability was, you know, they were, I was accountable. They were accountable. The team was accountable. And when, if you get in a situation where, where someone isn't carrying the water as the leader, you've got to make, you've got to make that go away because that's really when pe people are watching. So you can demonstrate vulnerability, I think, as a leader, but you can also, you have to be decisive and make the tough decisions and have the difficult conversations when you got to take somebody out. And mm -hmm. the whole team is watching if, when that happens someone isn't holding up their end of the bar. Will you tell us about, and you talk about this in the book, um, your first uh, year or so at Avis where the employee engagement scores uh, went through the roof and 
I think you even talk about that it was, people thought it was like a mistake or something that they couldn't possibly be that high. Uh, how, how did you, in just such a, sh a short time, and you were new to all of the 22,000 people, uh, how did you improve uh, that, that morale, that, that, that collaboration, that engagement um, so, so quickly? I mean, what were some of the things that you did on those first, those first months that, that really improved that score that I'm assuming they'd been taking these tests for, you know? Yeah, every year. Right? Yeah, every right. year. So, well, when I entered the company, I, I entered in the, as the uh, head of revenue generation and, and marketing for the company. And, okay. and a few, it was a few years, you know, then the recession hit in 08, 09. And it was a few years before I then became president of the company. And what I realized in the first couple of years while I was there is we had 22,000 people in the field. And we, I mean, these are blue collar workers, hourly workers. When you rent a car, you see some people at the counter, but the real work is done behind the counter mm -hmm. in the service bays where nobody ever sees. All right. And, and the way our company was communicating with people was through posters in a lunchroom. It, it was just so impersonal. And they had a job. They worked, they worked for the company. They got a job. They got a paycheck. And, and that's it. And I said, we got to change this. We got to do something different. And, um, and this is when I took over as the president. So we created our Rolling Pride bus trip and bus tour. And the objective was to get to meet 22,000 people in four months and shake every one of their hands and talk to them about some simple philosophies of the, of the purpose and the strategy of the company. But more importantly, it was to just say thank you, shake their hands, and then serve them. So we served them a meal. We got the first year we got to uh, 16,000 people. We, we spent, I don't know, 12 or 14 weeks in a bus. Uh, we called down to Nashville and got a country western music guy's bus and put offices in it. We didn't sleep in it, but we slept in hotels. But we used the bus Monday through Friday, and we were able to go out and and we were we got to meet sixteen thousand people, and um, and it all went very well. And early on, we were in New Orleans. I remember we were in New Orleans. And it was about a hundred degrees, and we and we met those folks. And then in September, there was a hurricane and, and I, it was over Labor Day weekend. It was over Labor Day weekend, there was a hurricane. And, uh, you know, we did all the right things, buttoned down the shop, protected the car, sent the employees home, all that stuff. But after the hurricane, when it hit New Orleans, it, this wasn't Katrina, this was a different one then, but there was no power. So there was no electricity, there was no, uh, there was no power, there was no food. So on Labor Day, we flew down uh, to, uh, New Orleans invited all of our families, um, all of the all of our employees, but then all of their families to the Avis lot air, at the airport. And and our guys came up from Florida and came over from other spots in Texas. And we brought co uh, coolers of food and and grills. And we we gave them their first hot meal as families. We put five families in a hotel and took care of them because their houses were destroyed. And Nobody had ever done that before for them. And so what they heard in June when we were there on the Rolling Pride Tour, and then they saw happened at Labor Day where we came back and, you know, on a holiday to just serve them, mm -hmm. um, traveled very, very fast. And then in October, Hurricane Sandy hit. And, um, and so the day after the hurricane, we went to the airport, uh, Newark Airport, JFK Airport, um, downtown Manhattan, uh, LaGuardia. LaGuardia was underwater. And we stayed open. And our employees stayed open and took care of people. We had, we had one lady who, who took a, 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 one of our customers because she couldn't get on a plane home and took care of her for three days until we could, you know, the plane started to fly after Hurricane Sandy again. So, and we, and then, so we went and saw them and then we had a huge uh, uh, party. In fact, and we asked everybody to wear a tie, which these are people that, that, you know, service cars, clean cars, change oil. 
and they, they we had crazy outfits, some of these outfits and ties, but they were so proud, right? And then we gave them a gift certificate to take their families to dinner. But it was just a thank you for going the extra mile during Hurricane Sandy. That traveled like crazy. That people realize they really do care. And so when something happens, they're gonna, we've got their back. So we're gonna do everything we can to have our customers back. And, and I remember it was the following summer. Then we did it every year after that. We didn't use a bus anymore because, and we got to about five to 8,000 people a year. Um, uh, but the following year, if you remember, there was a, a, a airplane crash at San Francisco airport where it was, it was one of the Asian planes that had come in and the, the pilot and the co-pilot were so kind to each other that the plane stalled and crashed right as it was landing and several people died. Well, it was on a Saturday because I remember getting a phone call and the San Francisco airport shut down. It was, we had the busiest day we've ever had in the history of the company in San Francisco because we had to get people home. So people were coming from other places because the airport was shut down yeah. and dropping off cars and people were taking cars and leaving. And our guys did a tremendous job, our team. And so we went and thanked them and just were you know, there's simple things, but be of service, say thank you, give them a hug, shake their hands, serve them a hot meal. It was simple things. And the engagement scores went up and up and up and up. And the hotline scores went down and down. Discrimination, my boss did this, that went down and down. The profits of the company went up. The shareholder stock price went up. Revenue went up, profit went up, everything just because we cared about the people. It's so interesting because it's the trickle down from you leading with heart and that to the employees who then treat each other with a special uh, care and then treat the cusp. Because I think you also said that during Hurricane Sandy, a lot of the other employees helped the employees who were um, uh, had had such disruption because of the hurricane being in their area. Then they feel excited about helping the customers and so the company does super well <laughs> and that's not the normal way we think a company get becomes even more successful we talked about um loving the people you work with we, there were many many locations where we have multiple um uh, people from all over the world uh, in that in the same location and and we just talked about simple things about dignity and respect and treating each other with dignity and loving the person that you work with you spend you spend eight or ten hours a day with them just treat them with respect and dignity and i mean just think about what we've been in in the social i'm in minneapolis right now in the heart of the chauvin trial going on downtown uh there uh, the george floyd issue how we treat people of color I, I would say in many of our locations on the East Coast, 95% of our folks are people of color and multiple nationalities. Mm -hmm. So we really needed to have a culture of inclusiveness. And, and it starts with respect and, and, and <laughs> respecting um, whoever you are and whatever your background is and wh whatever ethnicity you are. And it was very effective. That's why I say these simple things like drove the hotline calls down, which which improved because it improved the morale of the of all the of all the folks working together. It's very powerful. Mm -hmm. You talked about Southwest, and you have a great story in the book too about how Southwest is ex so successful, also with that same kind of um, uh, um, company aura that that you um, instilled at Avis. In fact, I didn't know this, but uh, the three letter name on the stock exchange is LUV. Talk to us a little bit about Southwest. You were very generous in your book about talking about other companies also and their success uh, leading with heart. Southwest, I think <clears throat> now has about 60,000 employees, 64,000. At that time, it was about 45, 50,000 employees. And when you uh, Southwest was a client 
started out as a small client and over time grew to a quarter of a billion dollar a year customer for Avis and Budget. Um, and, and I've talked to you about Dave Ridley, the CMO there, but, but when you walk into Southwest, just, just the vibe you get of, it is just awesome. It's just, it's just a beautiful, beautiful place. And, um, but you know, they have like on Friday afternoons, they have parties on, on, for all their employees on the roof of the building, which is right there at Love Field down in, in Dallas, you know, and they're really Gary Kelly, the CEO of Southwest is really an extraordinary lead with heart uh, leader and, and an example for anybody to follow. <clears throat> but they do, they do a lot of fun things. I mean, I don't know if I put this antidote in the book about when some lady wrote a, a letter to then the CEO Herb Keller and said, you know, when the lady gets on the microphone and makes fun, you know, it's funny I don't like it. It makes me uncomfortable. And he wrote back and he said, we'll miss you. <laughs> That's our culture. <laughs> this is who we are, you know, and go to United because they're not funny go at all. <laughs> go someplace else. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to say anything derogatory about any of them. But, I said it. <laughs> um, yeah. But I mean, that's the kind of thing they did. They had, uh, they told me a story of, uh, uh, they were interviewing several pilots and the, they bring all the pilots in and, and they put on the gear, the the <clears throat> overalls of a baggage handler. And two guys said, you know, they had like 28 people coming in for the interview. Two guys said, I'm not going to do that. And they said, okay, goodbye. We're done with you then. If you, if you got to wear your suit and tie, then you're too uptight for us. Mm -hmm. And when they did, uh, in fact, I just had this conversation with the CEO of ABM, the public company I'm on uh, the board of. Uh, we were talking about hiring. Mm -hmm. And when you interview for a key management position at Southwest, the, one of the people that has a, a say in whether you get hired or not is the receptionist. Mm -hmm. Because if you have every candidate that comes in goes through the receptionist and how that person treated the receptionist is, is when nobody's watching mm -hmm. is pretty critical. And so I thought that is really a great idea. I mean, I remember. Some, one of the guys at Southwest sharing that with me, and I thought, I've got to institute that. It's great. So, uh, and the CEO of uh, ABM and I just had this conversation last week, and I said, we need to implement this when we get back in the office, you know. So, great company. <laughs> That's a great <coughs> story. Um, speaking of hiring, there's, there's, there's also um, – the the bummer aspect of, of of letting people go and you have certainly probably had you know too many difficult conversations to count with people telling them that they're not uh performing up to snuff and and even having to let them go uh, what are your strategies to do this in a uh in, in a loving but but also a productive way so maybe they can even see part of what you're seeing and could even potentially help them on their, their next journey, their, their, their next uh, landing spot of wherever they're going to work. That is really critical because you're part of, I think, a leader's responsibility is to make sure someone knows why they didn't make it and what they mm -hmm. got to watch out for when they do whatever they're going to do next. Mm -hmm. And Alexander, you said that one of the things that you don't like is difficult conversations. And uh, that that is something to be aware of, you know, um, and and it's not easy for people, but the the ability to rehearse it, you know, rehearse it with somebody, maybe an HR or one of your close business people. But my philosophy is always be direct, not harsh. Do it in a loving way and as kind as you can be. But once you've made that decision, then be honest, be direct and do everything in your power to help that person succeed in their next role or wherever they're going to go. There's folks that I let go that I literally was a reference for and helped them get their next role, but <clears throat> not in the same role that they had in our company. They maybe went shifted from a revenue role to an operations role. Mm -hmm. They were really strong in revenue. They wanted to try. It didn't work you know, help them get back into a revenue generation role that, rather than operations role. Um, and so it's not easy, but to do it with as much dignity and grace as you can, and but do it. 
And because my philosophy, and, and, I, and I believe this in my heart, is that if somebody's not performing, before I know it, the rest of the team knows it. And if I see it and don't do something about it, then, then I'm accountable and, and then anybody can slack off, right? So my responsibility is the overarching responsibility of the company. And if someone isn't performing, it's my job to either coach them up, help them perform, or help them exit in, in an in a easy fashion, in a, in a good way for them and a good way for the company. But everybody else is watching. And so it's really, really important. It's not easy. We had, there's, you know, in larger companies like I was in, you know, we had a whole uh, human resource um, department that, that can be of help. But at the end of the day, I, if it was somebody that worked with me directly, I had to do it. I had to have the conversation. I never let anybody else do it. That was my responsibility. <clears throat> yeah, because I guess essentially you're letting everybody else down if you don't deal with that one person. 100%. So, 100%. Um, <laughs> um, for someone like, like I who wants everybody to like me, that the best thing to do is to, uh, you know, approach someone. And actually the truth, this is, when, I'm, when you're talking, Tom, I'm thinking of breakups that I've had with, you know, <laughs> lovers. And it's the same thing, is that you don't have to end up being mean or bad or anything if you're just honest and direct. And as you say, right. speak from the heart. Right. Yeah. And conflict is, you know, as you know, conflict is a difficult, very difficult thing. Um, we did a lot of coaching around how to have <clears throat> how to have tough conversations or difficult conversations, you know, and it's a leadership trait that should be taught on the way up through an organization. Um, the the other part of this whole thing about you know, is taking people out of an organization. More, most importantly is succession planning and actually help uh, plan a person's career to be successful and to get them in the right role at the right time and to be job ready for a promotion in a certain period of time or a certain location. And I just read an article this morning. Um, um, I don't know, it came from the private equity firm that I'm working with, that many of the CEOs around the country right now are really, really afraid of when we re-enter uh, the workforce, that there's, there's been this, you know, it's like kids in school, they're certainly not doing as well as they would have for the last 14 months if they were in school. And that's the same at work. Mm -hmm. And that I, the good talent is going to leave um, when they get back because there's been this huge void, cultural void mm -hmm. for 12 months or 14 or 18 months, whatever it's going to be. And so talent management and succession planning and really communicating with the talent in the organization about how you're helping them succeed is a critical component of retention and succession planning um, for the future of the company. Because mm -hmm. it's more important, way more important than taking some underperformer out. It's right. lifting all of the performers, you know. Well, we were just talking about, you know, the ten the pandemic and difficulty that it is, uh, you know, putting on people uh, personally, and then for these these CEOs that are, you know, have a lot of trepidation, rightfully so, about what that return will um, look like and feel like. What What are your uh, thoughts on the future of um, businesses changing because of the pandemic and because of what we went through in 2020, both from a, you know, a lead with heart perspective in terms of if that's going to be even more critical, you know, that style of leading. Uh, and then also just, I mean, even from, you know, what you did before at Avis, like there were so many so many less cars rented. I'm imagining possibly that they had to do a workforce reduction. Maybe they didn't, but some, some did. Oh, and oh, yeah. yeah. And how, how the recovery from that, um, what that looks like and feels like as we get back to normal. There are companies that are hiring uh, uh, HR specialists to manage remote workers because they think there's going to be 20, 25%, 30% of people will never come back to the office. 
there, there's a lot of discussion on hybrid models about, you know, like hybrid education. Um, personally, I'm not a fan of any of those. I mean, I, if it was me, I couldn't wait to get everybody back into the office. And because the culture of the company, I don't think you can really drive culture in a remote or even a hybrid situation. Mm -hmm. you, you really can't. However, there are going to be people that are just aren't going to come back. Yeah. And, but that's okay. You know, there's, there's people that are the, like the doers that are, are going to be able to successfully do from their kitchen table and, or their home office. And, but they're not going to be your high performers. They're not going to be your succession, you know, key succession people. Right. Um, but having people back in an office and, and, and building that culture is going to be really, really critical when it when it happens the incredible work that's been done in in this pandemic by companies and leaders to you know fully go remote is i i don't know that i would have of course i wouldn't have had the talent to do it but the team that i worked with you know they did they were superstars so they would have been able to figure it out very very tough but isn't there a, something to be said financially since a, co a company does need to examine the financials, that a lot of what we've learned from this last 12 months of being uh, having to work remotely is that you more people can work remotely and we don't have to be sending people to in-person meetings across the world, which would save a lot of money and time, efficiency. So that's how, and also and the environment. commercial real estate, they might not- And the environment, you're right. The environment, yeah. Um, the commercial real estate also, my businesses might understand that they don't need to have such large buildings because they could have a quarter of their workforce work at home. That's how, mm -hmm. that's the changes I'm seeing, but I am a total lay person. So I'd love you. No, to I think you're in, right. Tom. No, I think, I think you're hundred percent right. And <clears throat> you know, that's why if you follow any of the uh, advice from the airlines, for example, they're saying it's going to be um you know four years before we're back to where we were in 19 with in travel um i'm on the board of a hotel company and our hotels some of them are very large hotels they're they're uh, convention hotels uh where people come and 800 people thousand people for a convention those aren't coming back right away it's going to take a while but there is a need for some of it not as much as we probably did. There was waste um, al along the way, but there is a need for some of it. And, um, and there is a need for uh, leaders to get out and, and meet their clients, their, their, their employees and their clients in remote locations in something other than a Zoom. Cause it's really not, you know, it's, it's great. It's better than a phone call, you know, but it's not as personal as, having the opportunity to really take your team out and say, thank you, take them out to dinner and celebrate the excellent work they did that quarter or that month or whatever it is. So yeah. I think it will change. And, and I, but I, there's a, there's a piece of me anyway, that feels we have to get back out there and we have to see our customers. We have to see our people. Um, and yeah. it's been over a year. Even introverts don't want to stop connecting on a, <laughs> at least one-on-one -on -one basis, right? right. Oh, gosh, right. This, this has been wonderful. It was too short for me. I'm, I hope you'll come visit Southern California and I can shake your hand and say thank you. Thank you very much for having me. It was a real mm -hmm. pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. All right. Until next time. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Hey, folks. Okay. Back by very popular demand is our plant-powered plate fridge magnet, which you are going to receive for free if you leave us a rating and a review on whatever platform you're listening to this podcast on. So here are the details. Just write your quick review. Does not need to be long. Does not need to be a whole story. Just be honest and speak from the heart. Then take a quick screenshot of the review you wrote and email it to us at podcast at switchforgood.org. That's podcast at switchforgood.org and include your mailing address so we can send you a power plate. We are doing this because the more reviews we garner, the higher we go in search results, which means more folks will learn about our podcast. So the power is in your hands. Leave us a review 
and zoom, zoom, your power plate arrives at your doorstep. So thank you so much for tuning in today. If we helped you in any way, then click the subscribe button and let's keep hanging out together. We have so much more to share with you. And if you need more information on actually making the switch for good, please visit us at switchforgood.org for loads of info. And you can subscribe to our mailing list where you will receive all sorts of super cool gifts, discount codes to our very fave dairy-free products, and a lifetime of powerful health tips. So join us on the journey to switch for good. This is the future.